Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eben Escott. Thank you for joining me after lunch. Uh, this is definitely the uh, toughest uh, session to get through of the day. Um, so I'll do my best uh, to keep uh, you from um, falling asleep. Fingers crossed. Um, all right, uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is how we built uh, crowd sites uh, using uh, a specific approach uh, to building software called uh, model driven engineering. All right, um, so I've, I've spent a long time, um, probably tell by the bald patch up here, um, writing code. Um, and throughout those years, I've um, had a lot of experience uh, dealing with uh, situations with uh, developers. Um, one, of, one of the typical um, situations that I've uh, experienced in my career is when, when you've got a particular uh, developer who lights um, like uh, snuggle warts, for, exa for example. Um, what's a snuggle wart? Doesn't matter, it's just a thing. So this developer likes uh, snuggle warts and they, they're going to go away and they're going to start writing all their code and they're going to use snuggle warts and, and it's going to be brilliant and they're going to do it. And then an another developer comes in and he likes to use um, cuddle pies. Okay, and this, this developer decides, you know what, I'm going to use these cuddle pies. These cuddle pies are really awesome. And he starts doing things another way. Okay, and then, and then even worse is when the original developer leaves and then all the knowledge goes with him and then even more developers come in. And what we end up with is we end up with a lot of uh, legacy software. Um, so who's, who's been in that situation in their career? Who's seen that? Yeah, good for you. We've all seen it. Yeah, it's a massive, massive industry problem. Um, so what I, what I noticed, and you guys would have noticed this as well, when I'm, when I'm writing code and I want, to, I want to change something as simple as like a, a property on a class, okay? So I want to change a user to have a new field called middle name, okay? Now, if I'm going to add that in a software engineering process, I've got to add it to the domain entity, and then I've got to go and update this other bit of the code over here, then I've got to update a view, then I've got to update a schema in here, and there's all these different locations in the code base. So I just want to do one simple property change, and it has this reverberation or echo all around the code base. Okay, and we've all, we all would have uh, felt that. Now what was really cool, a few years back, we started to see um, some of the more advanced web application frameworks uh, come out with code generators. So you'd, you'd, um, you'd be able to define uh, your domain model uh, in, a, in a database and we'd hit a button and all of a sudden all these CRUD pages would pop out. So who's, who's had a go at one of those in one of the frameworks? Which, which framework did you? Yep, which one did you? Struts, yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, Silver Stride. Silver Stride, yeah. <laughs> awesome, okay, so they've got all these codes. They're really cool, aren't they? You're like, yeah, that's awesome. I'm like, this is great. Okay, and you, and you hit the generate button, you're like, wow, look how quickly I coded up all this. And then you're like, okay, cool. Now, I need to change uh, something in that view. I change the view, and then I change the property. I hit the regenerate button, and all of a sudden, all my changes are gone. Okay, so they're good right at the start, of the software engineering process, but they're, they're, on the day-to-day, -day, they're not there, okay? They're not there at all. All right, so armed with all that experience and the lack of wanting to live in England any longer and do another winter, I came back to Australia um, and I did my uh, PhD at uh, UQ and I wanted to come up with a, a way to sort of attack these sort of problems that, um, that I'd felt with in my career, okay? And during my time in my research, I discovered um, a style of programming, which we were discussing probably needs a little bit of rebranding, um, called um, model-driven engineering. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today about. All right, so what is a model? Okay, when we think of models, uh, traditionally we think of models of like uh, engine circuits, um, maybe a model of a house with walls, this sort of thing. Okay, that's traditionally what a model is. Okay, more recently, what we've been using models for is actually to make models of the software application itself. Okay, so um, when we normally think of a, a model in that sense, um, we, we, we all know a, a, a class diagram, we all know an ER diagram, um, those evil um, UML use cases, um, get those from a business analyst and there it goes out the other side. Um, we're all used to um, models in that sense. The problem, the problem with those models is they're, they're not actually used 
in the engineering process. They're normally done up by a business analyst or something like that. They're handed to you at the beginning of a, a, a development build and you go, great work guys on those diagrams. We'll put that aside now and now we're gonna build the software. Okay, so the problem with those models is they're not used in the actual process. All right, so quickly today what I'm gonna talk about is what is CrowdSites? a little bit about research to commercialization and where we're up to. I'm going to uh, put to you what the hypothesis is and talk to you about our development methodology. So CrowdSites, um, if you go to crowdsites.com, you'll see it there. It's one of um, a number of my startup businesses that I have. Okay, it's an online website builder. Um, you guys would be all familiar with um, online website builders like um, Squarespace and Wix and all those sorts of things. So we've got the nice drag and droppy type thing where you can drag things in, change things around, no knowledge of HTML and you can build a website. Um, and then what we've done is we've got a crowd crowdsourcing platform integrated with that. So as the, um, as the person who's creating their website gets to a point like, oh, I need some graphic uh, design work done, then there's a crowd of professionals there can go, a graphic designer, can you do me this picture? A content writer, can you write me some content here and you can pay for that. So it's a crowdsourcing platform and website builder sort of all on one platform. So you can think of it um, like a, a WordPress meets uh, freelancer or something like that. Okay, that's uh, what CrowdSites is. All right, so the interesting thing is techies, what we've done, um, we've built it using uh, PHP and MySQL uh, on the server side. Uh, then on the client side, we've used uh, Backbone, uh, Marinette and Foundation to get that uh, responsive UI and that sort of thing. So um, very uh, nice um, architectural style, we've got um, uh, the MVC on the server side, we've got the MVC on the client side, and then they communicate over uh, a REST API. Uh, and then um, obviously on the uh, client side, when um, that information received, it uh, throws off events and, and updates the view and that sort of thing. So we get that nice modern uh, look and feel all within the responsive UI. Um, so it sounds pretty cool. Um, in my career, I haven't had a chance to work on too many uh, code bases as far advanced as that. Normally it's dealing with some sort of legacy and that sort of thing. So we, we've had a wonderful time sort of uh, building this uh, framework. All right, um, just quickly. Um, so it started out um, as research, like I said. Um, got the tick in the box for the PhD. Um, would I recommend anyone else to do a PhD, um, uh, maybe, maybe not, see how you go, um, type thing. Uh, I got more out of it than what I, in fact, I got a different set of things out of the PhD than I thought I was gonna get out of it. Okay, I, I required different skills um, out of the PhD, but yeah, it was good. Um, since then, uh, we've been commercializing um, this uh, development approach in a product called MD SaaS. Okay, so it's um, targeted anyone trying to build a software as a service product. And you can take our, our framework and create a SaaS product in a few hours. Okay, and um, that's what we've been doing. Okay, so the hypothesis is, um, is that a model can be used uh, to improve development efficiency, software quality, and reusability. So there are our three main goals for it. Now this, is, this gives you a little bit idea of here we're going for. Up the top you can see we've got the reference implementation. Okay, the reference implementation is that typical project that you guys are used to. Okay, you go, oh, I need to build a web application that does X build out your favorite framework and you start writing it up. Okay, that's all the reference implementation is. It's your handcrafted code. Okay, so out of that reference implementation, what we do is we abstract up to a model. Then we use code generators to transform across to the target application. Okay, then the target application, we compare that to the reference implementation. Okay, so that's, that's the hypothesis from a high level. Now how that works on a day-to-day -day workflow sort of looks like this. Okay, so we start at, uh, an iteration, a new, art, a new artifact types needed for the requirement, so being passed a, uh, a new uh, requirement, and we go, yes, okay, we can't simply put something into the model, hit a generate button and have what we're after. We can't do that, okay, so we, so we need to do things. So the first thing we do is we build it into the reference implementation. Okay, so we go, oh, we can't support, we can't generate this bit of code, so we actually go ahead and handcraft it. So you're still doing all the regular things you do within software engineering. Okay, then we abstract up to the model, 
Okay, so we go, what is it in there? And we abstract that up to the model and uh, does the reference impl implementation compare to the generated application? So then I hit a button and then I generate next to it and I'm sitting there with the reference and what's generated. Are they the same? Yes, they are, I win. Okay, yes, build the input models and then I generate and we're done. Okay, so you're always going through this cycle. You get your new requirement coming in. Okay, you look at the requirement. Okay, have we already generated something like this before? No, we haven't. Okay, so we handcraft it and then we build it into the modeling solution. Okay, then we continue on like that. Any, any questions on that diagram? No? Okay, cool. All right, ideally you get to a situation where you're like this. Okay, so your model and your code generators have become sufficient, sufficient that you don't need to do any more reference implementation. You can just go, cool, I need a new requirement. I did that one last week. Okay, piece of cake. I'll just add that into the model. That regularly might have taken me three or four days work to do. I just did that in five minutes by building into the model, hitting a button, and it just generated everything out for me. So ideally, that's where you want to get to within your development cycles. Okay, um, so where do you start with the reference implementation? You start with good old CRUD. Okay, create, read, update. Okay, you start with that. Um, you can see there's some CRUD pages there on the right. And what we do is you build that up and then you generate that. Now, for those guys who've done that code generation before within an MVC framework, that's what you guys get anyway. Okay, because you, you look at um, the schema, you hit a button and it does all the, the view pages and everything for you. Okay, so that's sort of your starting point where you where you begin from. All right, now, as you add in more, um, more requirements into your uh, bit of software, what you're looking at is you're looking for specific architecture and patterns within the software, okay? The architecture and the patterns are the things that you use to abstract up into the model, okay? So the model ends up being uh, are, are all your patterns and architecture. All right, some of the um, typical web engineering patterns that we use, Okay, is uh, N-tier, we all know N-tier, model view controller, uh, domain-driven design. It's surprising how many, who knows domain-driven design, that one? Yeah, you all use it every day of software engineering, but no one knows it. It's a, it's a, it's a concept of having an entity or a, or a class that's just like a, uh, in Java terminology, a POJO, okay, which is just a, uh, a class with um, getters and setters. Okay, that's uh, a lot of uh, domain-driven design. Object relational mapping, we all use ORM. Who uses ORM? No? Yep, yeah, down there. Okay, you guys, if you're not using an ORM and you're writing software, um, you're running a race um, with one leg behind you like this, trying to run a race. I okay, guess so you should definitely look at using ORMs as well. Um, Service-oriented architectures, microservices, these sorts of things are the, the architecture that we look at. So as, a, as an old school engineer, I, I love my patterns, okay, and I love bu building beautiful architecturally created um, applications. All right, um, so what we're looking at is we use that to do our software as a service, okay, and we use the, the model to generate also across multiple target platforms. Okay, so um, at the moment you can uh, build something uh, into um, uh, the model, you hit a button, you get the browser-based version, you get the iOS-based iOS version, and you also get the Android version. Okay, so we just use PhoneGap uh, Cordova. So, um, so traditionally at the moment, if you make a changes, you've got even more places to make it because you're supporting all these phone apps as well. All right, uh, so uh, underneath the model, you have this uh, concept of a meta model. Okay, uh, the meta model is uh, just basically uh, the model used to describe your application and as you build up your reference implementation and your modeling language, you'll make uh, changes to your meta model and then you end up with your model. So here's a, one of our basic models. You can see the names here. I'll just use the phonetical alphabet. Uh, you've got a Lima and a Mike and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between those. You've got a Tango and a Sierra. A Sierra's got a self-reference and these sorts of things. You end up creating models like this. Okay, you use model-to-text transformations. Uh, code generators are really easy for web developers to understand. I do not need to spend any time whatsoever training a web developer how to use a code generator. Okay, so if you guys have used something um, 
uh, like a, a JSP or a PHP or anything like that. Okay, it's very easy. You've got your target language and then whatever um, you're using in between, you can use that to insert into that to output something. It's, it's how everything, all view technologies um, or the old school view technologies work in the web application world. So it's very easy to write a, um, a code generator. All right. Um, what we do is we, we don't believe that we're ever going to generate 100% of the application, full stop. I never believe that. Okay? We only ever try and develop, um, generate part of the application. All right? So we've always got this concept of manual changes. Okay? So you'll get 90, 95% of your code base generated, and that's all the monkey work that you spend hours there doing that you shouldn't be doing, and then you get to spend the majority of your time working on those specific problems where you're handcrafting, hand coding things in. Okay? So you add um, your particular code to solve business problems. Um, and how you do that, it's quite simple. Um, this is a, a PHP file. Um, we got, you got the concept of a protected region, and this is what most of the MVC frameworks don't have. So you write some code in there, okay? Next time the code's generated, that's preserved across generations. Okay, so that's simply how you, you augment your code um, with manually crafted code. Um, this is a bit of the icing on the cake. Um, we we uh, can do consistent document generation as well because we've modeled all the important parts of the application. We can hit a button and we get all our documentation as well. Uh, you beauty. Okay, um, we also have dashboard generation so we can mark particular bits in the model and then uh, the code generator is smart enough to inspect the model and say, hey, they want to know metrics around this particular part of the application, and then it'll generate all the uh, dashboard metrics associated with that, so you get all your nice uh, graphs and so forth. Um, it's all um, built using an Eclipse plugin. Okay, now this doesn't, it doesn't tie you to using Eclipse as your IDE. Uh, most of my developers, we don't um, specify uh, to our developers what um, uh, technologies they should use, especially their IDE. Uh, so what we uh, do is they just simply have Eclipse open and then they might have IntelliJ open or some WebStorm or something else that they're actually using. So they just use a, uh, Eclipse uh, plugin to do all the model generation and so forth. All right, um, so the next, the next thing uh, we talk about is actually doing the testing. Okay, so um, I, I sometimes get uh, flamed down for this one, but I, I strongly believe that the difference between an amateur and a professional developer are two things. One is their documentation, and the second thing is their testing. Okay, and I strongly believe that. So alongside what we've done, and this is the big bit in my research what I, where I got a tick and won awards and stuff, okay, is we also generate a lot of our testing alongside our code. So, man, here's the model, here's the development, here's the testing, pushed out to integrate, uh, continuous integration server, hit that, executes it all, and we get all the coverage metrics within it. Okay, so it's all a nice big uh, technology stack. Okay, um, how our test case are described are uh, using uh, Cucumber. Any Cucumber users? Yeah. Go on, you're using everything, that's awesome. Okay, um, for you guys who don't know Cucumber, Cucumber's a testing dom domain specific language. Okay, so as you can see here, um, this is how you describe your test. Now what's so awesome about Cucumber, okay, is that I can um, hand a Cucumber file to someone who's not a techie and they can read that. Okay, and that's a, a really easy to do. And it, it translates really easy. I, I remember um, going along to a meetup um, many moons ago. Um, I think it might have been one of the ones you ran, Nigel. Um, and um, and uh, looking under the covers of what actually uh, Cucumber was. Okay, and it's, it's very easy from a technical perspective. And as far as your developers are concerned, they can write their tests very quickly. I'm going to jump forward to the conclusion. Never know how long things are going to take. Um, so in essence, guys, um, model-driven model engineering for me um, is, is, a, a, is not at odds with regular programming. Okay? It's, it's a, an approach to building software which is supposed to complement your regular day-to-day -day programming. What it's aimed to do is it's aimed to create a consistent architecture 
an in a consistent extension of architecture across the software code base. Okay, and it helps nullify those problems we spoke about at the beginning. Okay, what else it also does, okay, is it takes away a lot of the effort, okay, required for you when you're doing boilerplate code. The code that we all hate doing, you're like, oh, do I really have to do that? Okay, because you've got to touch so many different files. It'll take all that away from you and allow you to concentrate on the interesting parts of the application that you're working on. Okay, and we've had uh, great success with it. Um, we, we generate um, over 80% of our code um, on crowd sites and um, it's very consistent, uh, gets that consistent user experience and we, we get really good um, test coverage as well. That's it. Question? Yes, please, please shoot. When you're comparing to the um, uh, reference application, how do you measure that uh, yeah, matching? Good, good question. I spent a lot of time thinking about that and um, early on in my thesis, and it's just a visual inspection now. Visual, visual inspections, all we do. We looked at um, a bunch of tools to help say how close it was and that sort of thing. Um, but honestly, the, the developers sitting there, when you see a developer working on it, when they're sitting there, they just go, yep, yep. And they run their tests as well, because you're getting the, the, um, the generated tests sitting down next to it, and you can manually add tests in as well. So you can still do your test-driven development where you go, here's a, here's a cucumber test, and you can write your test prior to actually writing the bit of code. And, and go ahead and do that, but yeah, it's... Um, but someone has to see this frequency. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's a visual, it's a visual inspection at the moment. I'm sure there'd be a way um, to, to make improvements for that, but thanks for the question. Any others? Small or large guys, far away. I was just wondering, if you generate the model automatically and then generate the tests from that, what happens if you have a sort of logical error from the beginning and then both of them are flawed? Yeah, oh, class, that's classic. Uh, um, they call that the lack of independence test and um, it's, it's such a hot topic within the model-based testing area and I did the sneakiest thing ever in my thesis to nullify it and I just said um, uh, testing uh, is, uh, your uh, testing is only one part of your typical unit um, system user acceptance testing and I just said well this is only one part of it it's up to the project management team wipe my hands clean it's up to the project management team to make sure that the user acceptance testing is ticked off but yeah if you're correct I'll, I'll rephrase you're correct in saying that if uh, a bug exists in the templates will the um, will the actual testing pick it up or not yeah we found well into the high 90s of the time it does so and um, any of us who have done testing we know it's a huge it's a huge trade-off between testing you've got um, a problem a state explosion problem and then you've got a maintainability problem um, some some developer writes a hundred tests um, and and then you've got to maintain those tests every time something changes and uh, lots of tests get turned off um, who as a manager has walked in and looked at their Jenkins or something like that and noticed that um, some developers have turned off some tests. Yeah, we've all, <laughs> they do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. But thanks for that question. Any others? All done? Yep. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I, I want to I hear your feedback as well. Like, do I need to rebrand this from something other than model driven? I'm um, trying to inspire you guys to it obviously sort of uh, introduces some overhead. What is the size of a project that this sort of makes sense and worthwhile? Um, it's, it's a very good question. It's like what, um, what ability, so, so what, they, what they say is you run a, a dual track process. So, um, so you have a development team and you have a modeling team. Okay, and then the modeling team works uh, alongside the development team. And there's actually equations you can use to work out you know, um, you know if, you're, if you need to write 12 files, handcraft it, and that takes you 15 minutes, or you write one file and one template, and then hit generate, and that only takes three minutes, then, then you've actually gained an advantage. Um, so there's, there's ways to actually work it out. I believe any size project. I used to, I used to think it was only for large scale projects. Okay. 
Um, but I believe any any size project uh, can benefit from this. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question. Um, it, it sounds good for a new project, but what about a project that's perhaps already 15 years of legacy later? Yep. Okay. So um, what we're what we're doing at the moment is um, we're using a, a tool. It's it's different to this one, but within the working mass environment, we use a tool called uh, Modisco. And what Modisco does is it, it analyzes source code and then pulls that up into uh, a model, and then we can do a series of reverse engineering to get a high level of model, uh, a high level of abstraction. Um, in Europe, there's a huge amount of research going into this at the moment because um, everybody's got these 15-year-old legacy systems that are, that, are, that are a nightmare. They're on technology stacks which are outdated and all that sort of thing. So what they're trying to do, the best way to do, is how do we get the good bits out of that up into a model and then they're generating down into the next um, technologies. So, yeah, it's a, it's a real interesting um, area. Of you can't just start again, right? No, 15 yeah, years of... Re you got... Yeah, you've got to move slowly and you've got to increment along and you've got to segment parts of the system. Let's do this bit. Yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge. How well does it work? It sounds pretty ambitious. Oh, how it's, it yeah, it's great. So what, what we did is um, we, uh, I'm going over time, we annotated, we went through, this particular application was Java and we annotated the, um, the application with a bunch of comments and then we ran Modisco and a bunch of other tools out of the top of it. And we, we could get a really rich model of what the, what the application did. Then we're able to take that model and use the forward engineering approach to, to recreate a comparable um, application. So it sounds all futuristic, I know. <laughs> it's, it's a bit hard to, to get. The, the best thing to do if you guys want to get started in, into using code generators is just to, is to have a look at a basic code generator and you, seriously, you'll pick it up in five minutes. I mean, our, our industry, what we're working on at the moment is very much focused on automation. So yep. to me, this also fits into that. It's, um, yes, this not, is software not, not automation. Sort of automating um, um, our other development procedures and everything like that, but automating the actual generation of the, the code from stuff that's common, I guess. Yeah, and we, we've, got, um, we've got a requirements matrix that sits over the top of this that listens to uh, the tests being run as well, so we can see requirements getting filled out as the, as the project progresses. For, so from a managerial position, it's um, quite good. We get, we're getting a, really, uh, a lot of really good feedback and interest. Well, I wouldn't say we've reached any sort of tipping point yet, um, but I'd, I'd like to uh, encourage the next generation of developers and people out there to have a look at code generators. Thank you very much, Eben. Thank Thanks, guys.